a good follow-up to today in our um, Engaging the Next Generation talk. So I really just wanted to talk more specifically about doing sort of weird, unexpected outreach. Um, one of the things, so I do, I do outreach at, uh, at NASA Goddard in the Astrophysics Science Division, and we really do have efforts in formal you know, classroom education, informal education, which is after school programs, museums, whatever, and then the outreach side of things. And um, <coughs> the nice thing about doing the outreach stuff is you're very <coughs> liberated in terms of how you can reach people and what you can do for them. Um, sometimes, I mean, sometimes you have to think, are people going to get what you want to do? But you can sort of experiment with different venues, with different methods. And so um, one of the things that I, this is an easy crowd, I think, to sell it to, but you've got to think outside the box to really grab people with the things you're doing. Um, there are a lot of communities that we would love to reach with astronomy that won't come to us. And we really do keep reaching the same audiences over and over. It's wonderful to have astronomy open houses. It's wonderful to have um, you know, stargazing parties. It's wonderful to have all these things, but you know from experience that you tend to get the same people, or at least the same kind of people, over and over. Um, and it's really disappointing when you think, but we live, for example, around here in a major metropolitan area that's full of all these people that never come. And why don't they come? Um, and so basically I've come to the conclusion that when you can, you should just bring the content to them. And so I wanted to talk some about that today, about sort of there's the, there's the what and there's the where. Um, and I think both are equally important in grabbing people when it comes to astronomy content. And luckily the what, we've got a lot of stuff that's really engaging. So sometimes the where is a really big piece of it. Um, so I wanted to start by talking a little bit and I'd like to then have a discussion about some of the weird things that we do or that we'd like to do. Um, hopefully as a springboard for some brainstorming about projects that could happen. Um, the way that I see it is that I don't know if you're familiar with like that pain rating scale, you know, when you go to the hospital and they got the smiley faces and you have I to have rate. one on my desk. Yeah, the Long Baker Pediatric Pain Rating Scale. Um, I see that as also being a continuum in science of people's comfort. Um, and I use this in presentations, I put up the Long Baker Scale and I'm like, where do you think people fall, you know, on this pain scale in their feelings about science? You have it there. I do have it on my slides. Um, I had this just in case I was in the room with the fancy projector. Um, but Glenn Beck kept me from ha having that room. Um, <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so I look at that scale, and unfortunately, I think a lot of people fall sort of on that that met face, you know, the one that looks like where's the chalk. You know, you sort of have the. Yeah, there's an even smile. They're all yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of us are here, and I think our audience is like here. And we're happy when they're here because they're not angry or crying. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, I really felt this pain scale was representative of our audience. And, um, and the important part is that when they're here, they're not coming to visit us. When their feelings are like this, they're not going to come to, a, to an astronomy open house. They're not coming to family science programming. Um, if they're children, they may come because their parents force them to. They don't consider that a winning situation. Um, you can sometimes win them over once you have them, but it is uncomfortable to start with people who are here and are there just because they're being forced to be there. Extra credit, um, you know, required by their parents. Their parents think it will help them. Get the required by their Girl Scout leaders. Yes, required by their Girl Scout leaders. <laughs> <laughs> We've been there. Um, so, really, I mean, you can't force people to go from here to here. But if you're not even getting these people, how can you even have an impact on them? So, one of the big things that, there, like I said, there's the what and there's the where. Um, I really think that you have to take things to people's communities, um, especially in communities. One of the things that we've worked with uh, locally was um, it's, a, uh, it's a Hispanic community group. And they said, if you want to hold programs for our community in Spanish, that's wonderful. You need to hold them in our community center. If you hold them in Spanish at NASA Goddard, no one will come. You have to hold them where the people already are, where they're comfortable, where they're connected. And lo and behold, those events filled up. Um, 
So it was like, okay, that's a group that you need to have a network, a partnership with to make sure that you're in their community. Um, any sort of weekday programming, you've got that entire group of kids that have parents that work until after the school day, and how are they going to take their kids to events that don't even occur when they're at home? Um, on the other hand, if it's a community center down the street, then it's really easy for them to get to. So there's a lot of, there have been some studies about things like PTA involvement, and um, the kind of people that are involved with the PTA are the kind of people who don't have to worry about 9 to 5 jobs where they can get to, the, you know, they can get to that PTA meeting. Um, and we're in the same boat that we have to be accessible to people. Um, also, I think if you're where the people are, it can put you in some really strange places. Astronomy in shopping malls is something that I think would be awesome. When you walk through there and they're displaying the newest car, and they're displaying, you know, you can play this Wii game and you can do all these things, but why can't we do outreach there? That while they're out there doing Saturday and Sunday shopping, that there's something they pass by that looks fun and engaging, um, and just have it there. You know, having it at a community center is fun, or having it at a school is fun, but if you're in the mall, you've got this audience that's going to go, whoa, what's, what is that? And kids that are going to go, that looks fun, I want to go do it if you have something going on that looks active. Um, and parents actually will see it as babysitting, which be careful about, but it's surprising. Um, the same thing goes for airports. Airports are full of people who are stuck in airports. And so <laughs> airports are a great place, again, to have, if nothing else, static content because there are people who are stuck there for hours on their delay and don't have a lot better to do than to look at an exhibit. Um, it's a little hard to get behind security, but like I said, static content, you can put it there. They have spaces for it. Um, and so places like that, I feel like, you know, it's going to do two things. One is take advantage of audiences who aren't seeking you out. The other is kind of surprise people because they're just not expecting to see that content there. So it's all the more interesting. If you ran the exact same exhibit at the Science Center, they'd expect to see it there. If you had the same community day at the Goddard Visitor Center, they expect to see it there. If you put it where they don't expect it, it makes it that much more memorable than it was weird. And I think people, people resonate with the weird. Like they're going to tell their friend, I went to the mall and there was some sort of astronomy something. You know, I thought I was going in to buy some shoes and I ended up looking through a solar telescope. Like what was going on? It's actually, it's memorable. Um, so that's one thing that I really, it, it requires some partnerships that I really think it's worth doing. And it's something that we wanted to do. It's tricky though because um, we are in competition with people who are willing to pay for those privileges. So the reason that the Lexus is in the mall is because Lexus will pay for it. And so one thing I'm interested in is strategies for making those connections and selling the case that this is more of, um, you know, this is the PSA territory of things as opposed to the advertising territory. This is something that people should support and want in their malls, want in their in their movie theaters, you know. Why can't we have astronomy factoids instead of those stupid Coke trivia questions before every movie? I mean, you see that Tom Hanks over and over again. Yes, the answer is flash game. I mean, it's like, but why can't we have something up there that's about science? Um, or, you know, on the Jumbotron at stadiums. They have it in a couple of places. They've had some science outreach there, but We've got that thing and it just rotates content, garbage content, and it's like, well, what would it take for us to get our stuff up there on the side of the buses in these weird and unexpected places? Um, so the other thing is the what, and we talked a little bit yesterday about in the um, engagement session about doing weird stuff. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about the bathroom project because we came up with one of our five things on this board, that board, whatever. Um, well, it's like right through the wall over there. Um, just pretend. And um, this is actually something that I think we can take a lot of lessons from other, uh, I guess I'd say expertise, fields of expertise. So marketing is a huge um, field that has a lot of research in it. Um, people really want to know what sells things to people. And in a sense, we want to sell things to people. I mean, it's selling knowledge and it's selling empowerment and it's selling um, excitement, but we're not always in the mindset of being a business. And I think sometimes this is a mistake that we don't think about basically why people consume. Because we want them to consume just like we want them to consume a commercial product. And if they don't know what you're selling, they're not going to buy it. Um, and if you're not advertising to them, they're not going to buy it. And so when marketing has all these studies to see, okay, where do we get the best messages, what messages resonate, and whatever else, um, that's literature that we actually can look at as outreach people and say, okay, this informs us about what to do, where to do it, how to do it. Um, how many words should you have on a piece of paper before people tune out? 
marketing studies that. Um, you know, what venues have really good retention rates? Marketing has that. And that's where um, a colleague of mine and I hit on this bathroom stall idea. Because I don't know how many of you go to bars, but bars have started having bathroom stall advertising. I mean, you're in there, and there's some ad for Axe body spray or some, you know, some, some something, and you're stuck there looking at it. And then we said, well, why can't that be a science factoid? And it has to be brief. I mean, you can't write an essay there and expect people to read it. Um, but we went for really straight up factoids. Like, did you know the iron in your bloodstream might have come from exploded stars? Um, you know, did you know um, that exoplanets, yeah, we've got some, some did you actually pass that around? Um, this is an out, and this is like sort of a spin-off of that project that was given out at an event, but it has, did you knows that we did that paired up trivia about the St. Louis area, actually, and trivia about space. Um, but just little things. And when we pitched this to people at NASA Goddard, we got questions like, well, I really need a paragraph to explain that, so how much space can I have on your, you know, your bathroom stall ads? <laughs> you know, I want to say, did you know that the, the iron in your bloodstream came from supernovae because, and then this, and then that. It's like, no, you really have to have that one thing that hits them, and then more. So in that case, we said, well, what if we had a website, um, unexpectedscience.com, that everything we did had that URL on it, for example. Does that still exist? No. Okay. Because we got shot down. Um, I could remember. But, uh, but we, that's the kind of thing where we said you got to have that. You do have to have that next point of contact once you grab these people with a factoid. Um, but it's a place to start to have that weird thing. And so I actually have a couple of examples I can show people if they come up and look afterwards of those bathroom stall ads because I wanted to have something visual about those after we talked about them. Um, we wanted the same thing with coasters. Um, we wanted to, again, look at the same thing for movie theater ads, for the size of buses, for the metro stations, for anywhere that you could put, like, one factoid, you know, in big print and grab people. And so, really, I think, you know, it has to be something that resonates with people that fast. I mean, you know, they just see it and it sticks with them um, in, a, in a weird place. And it really, you know, like, you bring it to them, so anything you wanted to add, Sarah? Nope. Um, so I really wanted to have a discussion about where we can take this and what kind of things you guys are doing with strained audiences or interesting places or what more importantly the audience is strange or? Well, <laughs> an unexpected audience. Sorry, I had to do that. I mean, frankly, we, we just tend to have these self-selecting science-interested audiences that are easy to hit. And my question is always, how do we reach the people we're not reaching? I mean, I can get teachers to show up at something, but how can I get their students to show up at things when their students are not science interested? Um, and it's actually not a question that I have some sort of magical answer for where I go, well, you just give them this piece of paper, and then magically they become, you know, science interested. So I can tell you the magic paper. Okay. Well, we're here, we're here so you guys person. can help us develop the magic paper. You are the magic paper. <laughs> I think it's full of some sort of mood-altering substance that might be illegal. Probably. It's on the interested odium or something. Okay. So okay. Just lick it and you will sign it. John, I thought it was going to be way easier. Yeah. <laughs> but it is, I mean, I'm very interested in, it's a community issue. So I wanted to raise that. Something just, just hit, my, hit my tiny little brain here. Uh, Snapple has been putting little factoids on the opposite side of their, you know, their uh, their caps. So maybe that might be something you might want to throw a factoid at, at there too. You know I mean? Popsicle put... sticks too. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. Popsicle. yeah. Candy wrappers. They even print potato chips with things like that on a map. Really? Yeah. Cool. And like, and I mean, like um, Pop Tarts, I think, had something on here. Yeah, food? yeah that. actually, that's right. The, 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 Right, the, that the oatmeal surprise, I have. That would surprise me. Oh, no, <laughs> no, 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 seriously, the, the, the little pack, oatmeal packets, there's some little factoid on the bottom of those. It, it, oh, yeah, it's so cheap these days, they're filling a little weight space. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, I think, I can't remember which, was it Pringles or one of them like that? that it actually had it on the chips. Yeah, it had it on the chips. It was like riddles or questions yeah. or something. On the chip? On the chip. Yeah. I, I would, I would take a feeling of words on, on food. food. <laughs> <laughs> it, really, it was like just it was dark on the chip, like it was cooked into There you go. So with these, I guess my next question would be how? That's really neat. I mean, are these things for sale? I'll do another I'll do another list for how. 
Well, they've got to be getting the stuff that they've put on there from somebody. So okay. yeah, well, um, chances are you contact mm -hmm. the manufacturers and different things. You can probably they probably want the meatball. <laughs> <laughs> That's usually the next step. And that's a meatball, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, snappy. most of the time, it's it's little. It's not connected to any kind of advertising or anything. So it's the random factoid stuff would be yeah. perfect for that. That's a really good idea. This is why I want to do this because I think meat. We know things, we have ideas, and um, I can put this whole stuff on the wiki when we're done of ideas that we generated. You know, the other thing I was thinking too, we were talking about uh, malls, mm -hmm. was uh, theme parks. You get solar telescopes out in theme parks. I know things like Hershey Park and six, some of the Six Flags have physics day. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah, I, you know, I, I live, I pretty much right down the street from baseball fields, and I'll drag my dog out as the ball games are ending and just drag it out to the corner of my street, and people will stop here to look at whatever. So I do a fair amount of that. It's very sensitive. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, the Halloween telescope is going to be really cool. Yeah, that's yeah. Cool. yeah. Um, so the Halloween Halloween telescope. I'm going to try to make this the, mm -hmm. sort of the what, and this the aware. The sure. aware as well, but it's more of a... Right. It's a thing where, not a place where. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> this happens on something. Mm -hmm. This happens right. at something. In something, at something. Yeah. On in county. something. Uh, county fairs. <laughs> yeah, actually we looked at that one time and never resolved what was expected of you. Um, Montgomery County, for example, mm -hmm. but it's like two weeks long. And so the question is, like, can we really staff something all day, every day for two weeks? That was our question with that one. Okay. Um, but fair, the, fair facts uh, in Arlington are yeah, only in Arlington a few days. Especially around the Baltimore County, especially, because mm -hmm. people, there's a lot of firemen's carnivals like that, too. So. There's that one that's really in the lovely. Westfield parking lot every, like, twice every year. There's the one at Laurel Wall that scares me. Yeah. <laughs> Laurel Wall should scare you. should scare you. Yes. <laughs> yes. All the car all the carnival rides. You just well, drive by. There wasn't a Ferris wheel there yesterday. <laughs> yeah. That's part of the there excitement. Was a Ferris wheel, and now there's this big line for the field across the street. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay. Anything else? Um. Could possibly get it into those annoying TV sets on top of gas pumps. It would be a lot less annoying than yeah, what they're, what they're about broadcasting that. now. <laughs> oh, good. Or even on, or even on, on the checkout lines in the supermarkets. Yeah. You know, I mean, they've got those, uh, they've got those, you know, flat screen panels that are always flashing advertising on there. Why don't you just throw something other on there? list? That's <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> then <all> edible. <laughs> yes. That's right. Again, not edible. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess again it comes back to the where because I think a lot of this is going to be grassroots and I always do have the question with these projects of when are things worth being grassroots um, and when do you really have to aim pretty big. So like when we were talking about shopping malls, um, we didn't think it would be that hard to get into some little independent shopping mall. But most of the malls in America now are owned by a handful of corporate mall companies. Yes. And they want you to go not through Westfield Shopping Town, I don't know if I find hilarious, they're called that, Annapolis's office. You take that to Westfield Shopping Town headquarters, which is in some yeah. other place where they want to have very serious legal, financial, et cetera, negotiations. The same thing with the movie theaters. We were pretty sure we could sneak something in at the AFI Silver Theater, which is you know, a single theater, or the old Greenbelt which is just, you know, community run largely and funded. But what about um, Regal, you know, or what about AMC? How do you get in there um, when Coke is happy to pay them tons of money for the exact same spots we want? Work with Coke and get them to spread the message. Well, and that's the possibility. Yeah, maybe you have to put their little logo Parker. somewhere, too. And yeah, but what, it's what, now what, and Coke, then. Well, and there have been these questions about what these things mean. I know that you can have partnerships um, and this isn't just a NASA endeavor, so it's not it's like I, I have to worry. It's, it's science. Um, NASA's meatball does appear on so my faces are my way. <laughs> I'll move them. I'll move them. I promise. <laughs> I mean, definitely, NASA has had its meatball on things with other sponsors of something. So if it's a co-sponsorship, there may be a possibility. But 
Like I said, I don't see this as, as NASA's endeavor as much as a community endeavor. Um, that's why I was afraid yesterday a lot of things went straight down the NASA path and why NASA can't do it, but if we're an entire group of people who are advocates for these things that come from all different backgrounds and organizations and we can be enablers for each other and content providers and you know, we may not be able to be the one with the money or the one with the contact, but if we know the people who can help with those things or we come together, I think we can make it happen. It's very important those spaces go back up. <laughs> Um, I think a big piece of this is accessibility, is going to be a big piece of it, and the other one is it has to be that really resonant, real world, connects with them content. Um, and that's a big thing when you're making, when you have to say something, and we had that Twitter session yesterday about saying something of 140 characters. I think again, if you're putting a factoid on a popsicle stick, you have to be really concise and really hard hitting. Those whatever you get ten words or something have to really make someone go, wow. Or they might as well just be word salad. Oh yeah? Oh well what about the pe the people personal story angle that we were talking about and how you have to tell a story? Like can we would we consider putting facts on there about like the astronauts and their personal lives or you know Probably like too much for a personal no. thing, not right? not a personal <laughs> Not not a story story, but like just keeping in yeah. mind, you know, it doesn't always have to be, you know, all the atoms in your body would fit into the size of a marble if you remove the empty space. I think it depends. I mean, I think the content will depend on the venue. Yeah. Because I think if you're looking at something, I mean, some of these are places people would be, in which case they do the storytelling and the personal connecting. And things like if we were up on um, a TV screen somewhere, they could even show short clips. It's not limited to just a handful of characters. Um, but I agree, the storytelling is incredibly important for an audience that's not connected, it's a connection. Um, so whenever we can work in things that resonate with people, it's going to be good. Someone online is suggesting uh, whenever these things are done, especially events, to get uh, media involved, local media. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Both, you know, both print and, you know, TV. Yep. Print, television, <laughs> radio. Well, that's something that, um, it's always really sad to me how little coverage any of these things get. I mean, whenever we do stuff, it's like, we're doing something really interesting, and really that human interest story about puppies on the news does typically trump us. Um, those puppies, though. Puppies, I know. Those puppies. And that always drives me crazy because I really would rather know about things to do in my community or the way someone did something really impressive in science over, like, I don't know, a kitten that did something. I do love kittens. Two, two <laughs> years ago, Wheaton had, like, an entire community day based around astronomy and science. Did we know about that? We weren't there. I, I, didn't, I, wasn't I didn't hear about a single, you know, NASA booth or sponsored anything. Like it was just it was totally independent. And I admit I do frequent Google news searches on terms just to find out what's going on because I don't hear about a lot of things if they're not top level. I mean I can tell you about colliding planets, but I have no idea about whatever's going on in people's communities or those more personal stories. And it always interests me that local papers are often picking up, for example, the story of scientists in their community who are doing things. Um, the local papers are picking that stuff up, and sometimes I find out more interesting things about community and people from the local papers than I do from, say, like, the Boomy Blade is a good place to look, but the Washington Post will have that content. And I think there's a reason for that in terms of keeping the audience interest. But Google News assimilates a lot of it, so it might be something to look at. We have the problem that, like, at Kennedy Space Center, there's all kinds of stuff going on and, and working out there, and I don't even hear about it. Um, now I've started to realize a lot of it because I'm following somebody who's in like public relations stuff and she'll tweet about, oh, I'm at the KFC Olympics. I'm like, we have an Olympics? <laughs> <laughs> and well, we had a safety day with the, the tractor driving. Did you see that? Yeah. No. There was, a, there was a forklift obstacle course. Oh, oh that I was it. And the fire extinguisher contest. Yes. Um, well, then I guess I the question is, about this. <laughs> <laughs> man, you missed out. <laughs> How would we keep up with these things then? 
I mean, it's not our job to keep up with them, so who do we need to tap into to find out about community events and opportunities? Well, they just there needs to be a better way of getting them out in a central location when this kind of stuff is happening so that people know where to go to look for it. Or, or somebody just needs to make it their full-time job to... I run a, so I, and I am going to put run in air quotes because I don't get around to it a lot. I have a Twitter that I've tried to do that locally. Here, here For people to get involved in, a, in astronomy stuff, here are things that are going on. But it's too much time for me to keep up with it, and I don't hear about a lot of stuff. So I tell her whenever I hear something, but we don't hear about it. So it ends up being a, a, way, a, a mostly dead Twitter account that occasionally I go, oh, hey, look, there's this thing. And then it goes back to being dead. Speaking of Twitter accounts, I just put a, you know, you just tweeted some, some sort of like, did you knows and blah, blah, blah. There's actually a bot, yeah. a did you know bot that I just discovered that will just go ahead and retweet anything that says, did you know? Oh, <laughs> interesting. Oh, I didn't know that. I just found that. <laughs> did you know there was a bot? Yeah. <laughs> Did you know there's a bot? Well, and it is funny. Tweet. Twitter has become this kind of thing where um, one time I tweeted how much I hated a certain brand's alarm clock, and within 10 minutes I was retweeted minus the hate part um, by that to go like, I have that alarm clock by the company yeah. that made it. And I had to respond like, please read the tweet. Or, yeah. or <laughs> I, I use the word company. something like, yeah. um, you know, death trap. I think was the phrase I used. <laughs> 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 I mean, just taking that out, but. Um, <laughs> now following me because I said how much I love one of the local grocery stores. Yeah. Um, so that doesn't really surprise me, but oh my goodness, I am going, that's, that's one day's work. Just yes. tweet all my duty. <laughs> <laughs> all day, every day, I'll just tweet NASA. We, we collected dozens of them for NASA, did you know? But I think that one, one advantage with Twitter and everything being all combined is that even if you can't have constant, uh, you know, constant output, you know, People don't necessarily notice that because you know when it pops up, it's there. And sure. I mean, it's better. I mostly get just more wish stuff. I could get yeah. more of it out there because I, I know obviously. there's got to be tons more going on than I ever hear about. And I work with Girl Scout groups, and I know they would love to. The ones that have gotten science interested, I know they would love to know about other things they could go to. That's yeah. I started it with them in mind. Oh but, sure, and you'd like to do that, but but the advantage of Twitter as opposed to like you know a blog and that kind of thing is. You know, if you don't have any content for a few weeks on a blog, people will stop reading it. Or Twitter, you know, as long as it shows up when it shows up. As long as you don't have too much. You yeah, yeah. exactly. And as long as you don't let too much time lapse, because people tend to clear out their, um, their groups of, of do, an Do people account. do that on Twitter? Yeah. 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 There's even tools that will show you which accounts haven't tweeted for 90, 60, or 30 days. So and you, you can, can just hit yeah, one <coughs> button and clear them all out. I just keep those because I'm like, well, someday maybe they'll tweet. They're not bothering me. Depends. <laughs> depends. Sometimes I will, sometimes yeah. I won't. It depends on if they were at least once a month. Yeah. It helps that I have four Twitter accounts, so that's... <laughs> <laughs> I keep up with different people Wait. in different places. Define helps. Because <laughs> I have five, and I don't think I would have used that phrase. <laughs> well, one of the four personalities likes it, so we're in good shape. Um, I was, uh, last session, we were talking about different things we could do to uh, provide tools for space advocates mm -hmm. to share stuff online and so on. So basically, I, was, uh, I took a whole list of, of requirements and things that I could go back and try to set up something and see if. Uh, if it's uh, worthy of using spaceadvocacy.org, if right. it's, uh, since it's in the family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and a lot of these things that are coming up are things that came up in, in, in okay. that, that discussion. Um, Weird Outreach was, was one of the sort of things that we wanted to put on, on the site. Okay. Um, I had a point and I was going towards it. I don't know where it went anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but, Let's um, keep talking. Um, circle from earlier. Yeah, it must yeah, be the traffic right. circle, right. Um, uh, there are many tools out there for collaborative Twitter accounts. So I'm imagining a Baltimore slash DC slash Maryland or Virginia, whatever you want to call it, um, science Twitter feed, which could be integrated into something like that type of science. So if you have a, a short list of people who are trusted, you know, on Twitter. I'm sure you know it, it was great to have to have you put everything. Like you said, you might not hear about everything. Mm -hmm. Somebody else hears about it, submit it to the same sure. sort of Twitter and get it get it sent up there, and that sort of uh, Meeting up with people who would have that information would be would be something that 
Um, sure. I, I try to take on. Um, if anybody cares about it, I'll at least write down what it is. <laughs> Well, so one of the things I'd like to ask, um, and I kind of brought up earlier about thinking like a different type of business, is who else is in the business of wanting to put their messages in the same place, and can we learn from them or use them in any way? Because I feel like, um, for example, certain types of groups show up at the county fairs and the carnivals and these places, and they must have some way of finding out about when and where they are because they're interested in being there. What can you know? Where? Where are other groups, either commercial or community, finding out these things? Because there must be other people like us that want to be in places, possibly for more commercial reasons. But you know, how do they learn about these things? You know, are we missing out on something that's out there because we're thinking about it in an astronomy outreach way and not in a, I don't know, selling local organic cookies way? Or a, I mean, you know, where where do people? get community information when they want to sell fences. I mean, you know what I'm talking about when you yeah, go to yeah. you go to events and long fences at every single one of them, or the roofing people, or the windows people, um, or different groups that are soliciting uh, donations from whatever it is that they do, where did they find out Maybe about like it? a chamber of commerce for an area or something like that? That's possible, yeah, because you have that, that, yeah. that the, uh, that coffee news. Uh, if you guys get that down your way, nope. and a bunch of little cafeterias all, all around Baltimore, they have this thing called news, but it's basically you know, a placemat with a bunch of advertisements and all that kind of things are way. Because all of the, the things like carnivals and fairs and all that, I would imagine, has to be permitted through somebody, so the Chamber of Commerce will probably know about it. Coffee news, I'm curious I might go on over here, but I give up on the thing. It's on something, but it's not cats. I think it's probably about the house. It's so on something that's at many different things. <laughs> it's a popsicle stick. It's out of it. Um, <laughs> but is there anyone else that we can think like? Because that's really, a, I mean, like I said, to me, that's a big thing for us yeah. to grasp is that we're kind of in business. Maybe like the Humane Society and or Humane Societies, and you know how you see their messages around like um, spay and neuter and adopt, and adopt pets and stuff like that. That's kind of another outreach type of a activity. Um, yeah, yeah, we talked to them briefly at that we did conference that one. Because <laughs> there are community groups that get out there at things. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's, it's, I we put that in the category of things to research. Yeah. And I know there are groups that I'm involved with I'm that do this. But Specifically I'm for humane society, one. each individual humane shelter usually has a person or possibly three people part-time or one person full-time who does nothing but that sort of thing. Which we may or may not have, but we can at least figure out what they're yeah, well, and I, I mean, I know I'm involved with groups that don't have somebody who does that all the time, but somebody figures it out somehow. Some it's it. just not me, so I, I, you know, I, there are people I can definitely talk to and say, okay, where are you getting this stuff from? They're a good example, too, I think, because they're not a big corporation that yeah. has tons of money to spend on stuff. Well, neither is your local historic society. I know I belong to one back home. Um, I'm, I'm on board over there, and we try our darndest to get into places like, you know, supermarkets and things like that just to get membership drive and let them know that you know, we have this restoration effort going. If you want to come by and just swing a hammer for a couple hours, please, by all means. But we run into the same things that you guys run into, especially with these larger malls. Like, you know, there's one by me that you know, is run by Simon. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and, yeah and, and they are like, you know, okay, there's just so much red tape to go through. We just finally said the heck with it. Right. And because it was it was it was such a it's such a morass, so we just and, and we lost out. Mm -hmm. So maybe we could you know collaborating with other local groups in the area, not just humane societies, but other nonprofits. And it's possible we need a nonprofit. Yeah. One of the things we've hit is um, these things really to have them be free or basically at cost. They need to be PSAs, so they're, they're seen as needing to be a, a public service announcement. In which case, they need to come from someone who has whatever the qualifications are to issue one of those. Um, that was not something we that, don't. that NASA really does. We don't do PSAs. Um, so if you want, if you want to put an ad on the side of a bus, it costs, it costs an amazing amount of money. It was a ridiculous amount of money, thousands and thousands of dollars. It's a cardboard that goes on the bus for a few weeks, really. I mean, yeah, but how many people see it? 
Right. So, so you're paying for that. You're paying for the exposure. They put it up either cheap or free if it's about anti-smoking or if it's about um, you know uh, statistics about health issues or whatever it is. And um, there is a public perception that those things are more important than science. Um, that's you know in terms of like. I don't want my baby to die, but I really don't care they about link that. up somehow? But uh, yeah, I really feel like there's got to be a cell we can make that that is a PSA. Science education is worth public service announcements. Can you maybe partner with organization or, or corporate um, entities that have a stake in science? Um, I mean, like this is kind of a weird one, but like say Ron Johns has billboards mm -hmm. all over the place, and by their location, they kind of have a stake. In, in space, space. <laughs> right? So yeah. maybe work something with them. Yeah, we figure out how to write that. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. In 140 characters. Yeah. <laughs> well, but even people like you know people like Northrop Grumman are looking for scientists and engineers. So well, and maybe that's what's interesting is they rent out locally entire metro cars to fill out. But all the advertising in a single metro car will be from one of the big aerospace companies, which I'm always really impressed with. That they do that. Yeah, I think you just hit on another non-edible idea. Tell me, I don't think in public transportation. Um, well, you know, no, I would <laughs> sticking a PSA up, you know, sticking a little back to it on, on like a metro car. You know, maybe if we can talk to, you know, one of those groups and say, yeah, if you're going to be renting out a metro car, could we have one spot mm -hmm. for some science factoid? Right. What about sidewalk advertising or like stuff that's on the ground that you see as you walk up to it? That would be really cool. You see, actually, they're doing that in supermarkets now. Yeah. They've got actually adhesive um, ads that are placed on the floor. They've got such good materials now that I'll hold up to that. that and in some cases, yeah, exactly. In some headboard cases, headboard. they're not even adhesive. There's actually a, it's a, it's a small little embedded light board in mm -hmm. the floor. And it, you just pull out and place it in there. As an FYI, it was 1142. Well, you can go on forever with all this brain stuff. <laughs> well, but what I really wanted to do was collect some of this um, and put it together. And the how was actually the most important thing to me, because I think we could generate these all day. Um, and they're all good, but we really could go on forever. But the big question is going to be how. Because clearly, if we're not doing it, um, there's I mean, beside the, we have the ideas, so why aren't we doing it? And I know it's often just obstacles where you, you know how hard it is to get information out sometimes, you know how hard it is to get partnerships with people, especially big companies, um, when you're not, you don't have an in and you don't know anyone and you're not offering a huge amount of money. Because um, money talks. I mean, if we could come up with ways to pay for these things, you show up somewhere and say, I can pay, you've got it. Kickstarter. And that could be that could be a Kickstarter. It just pains me that some of these things could be free if we just somehow, or could be cheap if we somehow just went about it the right way. I mean, if, if, I, if I were any other group doing something that I think is public a public service, and I could get a PSA, but somehow for space science I can't get a PSA, that makes me angry. You know, it makes me angry that I can't have that space to do something that I think is equally important as other community and public messages and educational messages. Maybe it's about um, approaching the right organizations that have budget for to be used for things like this. Like um, I know there's um, the Astronaut Memorial Foundation that collects the money from the license plates in Florida that are sold. That's the um, mm -hmm. Challenger and Columbia ones. And if you could pitch it to them, they'd probably be more interested even, than yeah. Or even partnering with an organization like Liberty Science Center. Maybe getting both. You know of your stuff out there that way. There's a whole board with just smiley faces. I know, I'm just trying to know exactly <laughs> yeah, I was supposed to write from that. Because <laughs> <smiley faces. laughs> I said my challenge to you guys is take these ideas. Like I said, I'll put I'll try to get these organized in some sort of edible and inedible fashion on the wiki. Take these ideas and try to take them that one step further. Even just one of them that interests you and see if you can find someone that will help make it happen. Because that's, the, that's really where I know, personally, I have stagnated. Um, I have a coaster that's ready to go. I have these bathroom stall ads that are ready to go. But I don't have the how, because that is always where it gets stopped up. Um, bathroom ads in bars, besides the fact that they probably also somehow promote alcoholism. 
Um, I, you know, okay, those actually get sold. I mean, there's a bathroom advertising company that manages them. If you just, if you want to have them nice, so they have plastic covers and they slip the paper in and it's not going to get destroyed and ripped down and graffitied in five seconds. Um, so, how, you know, that's who I really want to be in with, not just a bar that will let me stick some stuff up with tape that will get ripped down and destroyed in two nights, but, you know, how do I get that bathroom installed? Two whole nights, you're optimist. I'm very optimistic. <laughs> Maybe a Tuesday and a Wednesday when there aren't a lot of people coming through. But the, the, in trying to get into the category, I mean, because a lot of these advertising things have the, when they haven't sold something, you know, they don't leave it blank. They, they stick put, something there. They put their own ad They put their own ad in there, but, but frequently their own ad is just, you know, there's not much to right. it, and they could put more. So, you know, that seems like an opening. Yeah. You know. And maybe that's something to say, that, you know, we're not looking to be the headliner on these things, but more of the, when the space is there, could we have it? Right. Attract attention to your by our ad. Fortune cookies. <laughs> oh, oh, I like that. <laughs> I like that a lot. We've got some fortune cookies. In food. Yes. 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 On food, outside of food. I'm almost tempted. Of food. Does anybody buy Cracker Jacks anymore? The old prize? They're all these little cardboard things. And then mm -hmm. you can actually customize. Yeah. Now that gets me tempted to do like one custom order of fortune cookies with, with science factories and then think about them. That would be fun. Suggestion from the chat room there are grocery stores that have all these sort of pamphlets. Blitz and stuff at the door, the front door. Oh, that turns some people off. It does. My husband will go to a different grocery store if there's anyone standing out front. Well, well this is just a pamphlet. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. yeah. They also have the um, advertising that's on the grocery store carts. Yes. You know, at the at the end of them, they have like a little. The license panel. plates on the uh, the grocery carts. So <laughs> the the grid of pamphlets, most of the public libraries have too, and they're pretty likely to not charge you for space. The well, libraries are great. Um, I've had some debates at conferences with people about uh, whether they end up being a fairly self-selecting audience as well. But, but it's, it's, a bigger, it's a bigger self-selecting audience. In yeah. case you're wondering, <laughs> food is here. Well, I think you can hold food. We have food too. We have come up with food that we put yes. science in. <laughs> 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 it doesn't have science on it. <laughs> 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 I love it. Um, the, uh, some movie theaters in the UK have these array of things by the exit, and it's loads of little postcards. And I don't think they're really particularly commercial. They don't seem to be selling them. Oh, they're going to say that actually people were willing to pay to just put like pamphlets on the exit of the theater, and they're going to sell them. Outreach, I think it would be hilarious. Like, whatever the local classifieds are, just keep slipping, like, I don't know, science into the personals. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Meat manufacturers to put a science factory on the back of their paint chips that would be most. That would be unexpected. That's an edible, but. <laughs> can, we take, can, we take, can we take out Craigslist <laughs> adult ads that are science outreach? Yeah. <laughs> that would be unexpected. Yes, it would be. I guess as long as you're not lead paint chips, I guess. <laughs> um, so, can I make a quick suggestion? I apologize because I was late, so I have to not repeating anything. Um, but I've been thinking about this since uh, yesterday, actually, since the Yuri's Night um, uh, talk earlier. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I actually, like, I, in fact, the reason why I was late today is because I also run a photography venture to promote local photographers. And in D.C., there's, like, a big kind of, un, not, I don't want to say underground, but an arts movement to, like, just do it yourself. Um, and we have tons of events, like, parties. And, like, I have a friend who's gotten really successful at just doing these. She just rents out this empty building and gets a bunch of artists and, you know, gets together. And we'll get, like, the D.C. Roller Girls or something like that. And this is the kind of stuff, like, I was thinking that I think I'm going to do a Yuri Saint photography contest slash party or whatever. And this is the kind of stuff, like, man, yeah, like, make a bunch of fortune cookies and leave them out. You know, people love this stuff. So it's like, you can do all of these things at these other, like, art events. And you, that's not going to work in every single town, but I'm sure you've got, oh, like, random events, like, Wait, that, right? with people at kind of our age who are going to about art events. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but, and, and the, uh, uh, Sort of a different side of it, rather than going to events with different sorts of people at them, adding different sorts of stuff so that you know, so that science-oriented events attract different sorts of people mm -hmm. in addition to the usual ones. And that that's also yeah. I mean that, that's my end goal as always. I want people to not feel like the science events are off limits and scary. And but we had an art unveiling at the visitor center, um, but it didn't get advertised as an art unveiling. It got advertised as a public lecture. That makes a really big difference. I was like, it's an art unveiling, and they were like, public lecture. But I'm science interested, and I wouldn't go. 
<laughs> so anyway, I won't keep people from food. We're a couple minutes over. Um, we do have tons of goodies to reward you guys for sitting through this horribly painful. Rated on the pain scale. <laughs> All of this in goodies too. Double oh, tears. Uh, I think I'm over by that handwritten. <laughs> what the crying one? <laughs> He's crying with joy. Oh, yes, exactly. Oh, that's that's good. Good. Yeah. Good. 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 <laughs> Thank you guys so much. I like I said, I promise that we'll type this up and put it on the wiki. And I hope that I do have business cards. I'd love to talk to people who have ideas or yeah. want to work with we us. Both do, um, because I, yeah. we're really interested in this. I think this session and yesterday's sessionopolis, session zilla, whatever it was. <laughs> um, I think we're beginning to realize we are screening out for some sort of space advocacy network. Yes. That means we can do this all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what we need. Well, and we need the network to do that because you if, if we keep to doing mine it. this afternoon, we can continue this. What yes. time? <laughs> well, I don't know. It's <laughs> in green. No, I don't like it because your, your, your piping thing is too awesome. It's way better than my little Well, fine. Wait, is, that have you got a wormhole in it? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I need goodies. Take but the wormhole has like DNA. It's like a take, take. science awesome. Well, must have goodies. Must have goodies. Oh, these are good less good <laughs> more. If someone goes to one of the lights, they are um, DIY Look at one of the lights first. through that. Look at the lights. So I, there are two Wait, stacks of cards that look identical. Um, they have different last names. Oh, We're both okay. named Sarah, so um, <laughs> <laughs> we sit next to each other in an office together to confuse people. So be oh, even better. <laughs> the thing I like, didn't do. You walk in Sarah, yes, you say in Sarah. I'm Mitchell, and this is Iron. Okay. Look through the last yes. Here Again, some of the stuff you were mentioning with, from you know nonprofits, we're running into the same problems as you are. You know where we can't get into places, and yeah, things like that. Oh my goodness, um, we end up with the double frustration of we feel like this is a good follow up to in our um, engaging the next generation talk. So, really, just wanted to talk more specifically about doing sort of weird, unexpected outreach. Um, one of the things, so I do, I do outreach at uh, at NASA Goddard in the Astrophysics Science Division, and we really do have efforts in formal you know, classroom education, informal education, which is after school programs, museums, whatever, and then the outreach side of things. And um, <coughs> the nice thing about doing the outreach stuff is you're very <coughs> liberated in terms of how you can reach people and what you can do for them. Um, sometimes, I mean, sometimes you have to think, are people going to get what you want to do? But you can sort of experiment with different venues, with different methods. And so um, one of the things that I, this is an easy crowd, I think, to sell it to, but you've got to think outside the box to really grab people with the thing. They come to, a, to an astronomy open house. They're not coming to family science programming. Um, if they're children, they may come because their parents force them to. I don't consider that a winning situation. Um, you can sometimes win them over once you have them, but it is uncomfortable to start with people who are here and are there just because they're being forced to be there, extra credit. Um, you know, required by their parents. Their parents think it will help them. Get to required by their Girl Scout leaders. Yes, required <laughs> by the Girl Scout leaders. <laughs> We've been there. Um, so really, I mean, you can't force people to go from here to here. But if you're not even getting these people, how can you even have an impact on them? So one of the big things that, there, like I said, there's the what and there's the where. Um, I really think that you have to take things to people's communities, um, especially in Communities. One of the things that we worked with uh, locally was um, it's, a, uh, it's a Hispanic community group, and they see what you're doing. Um, there are a lot of communities that we would love to reach with astronomy that won't come to us, and we really do keep reaching the same audiences over and over. It's wonderful to have astronomy open houses. It's wonderful to have um, you know stargazing parties. It's wonderful to have all these things, but you know from experience that you tend to get the same people, or at least the same kind of people, over and over. Um, and it's really disappointing when you think, but we live, for example, around here in a major metropolitan area that's full of all these people that never come. And why don't they come? Um, and so basically I've come to the conclusion that when you can, you should just bring the content to them. And so I wanted to talk some about that today, about sort of there's the, there's the what and there's the where. Um, and I think both are equally important in grabbing people when it comes to astronomy content. 
And luckily, the what, we've got a lot of stuff that's really engaging. So sometimes the where is a really big piece of it. Um, so I wanted to start by talking a little bit, and I'd like to then have a discussion about some of the weird things that we do or that we'd like to do, um, hopefully as a springboard for some brainstorming about projects that could happen. Um, the way that I see it is that, I don't know if you're familiar like that pain rating scale, you know, when you go to the hospital and they got the smiley faces and you have I to have rate. one on my desk. Yeah, the Long Baker Pediatric Pain Rating Scale. Um, I see that as also being a continuum in science of people's comfort. Um, and I use this in presentations. I put up the Long Baker Scale, and I'm like, where do you think people fall, you know, on this pain scale in their feelings about science? You have it there. I do have it on my slides. Um, I had this just in case I was in the room with the fancy projector. Um, but Glenn Beck kept me from ha having that room. Um, <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so I look at that scale, and unfortunately, I think a lot of people fall sort of on that that met base, you know, the one that looks like where's the chalk. <clears throat> you know, you sort of have the Yeah, there's an even smiley. They're all yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of us are here, and I think our audience is like here. And we're happy when they're here because they're not angry or crying. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, I really felt this pain scale was, was representative of our audience. And, um, and the important part is that when they're here, they're not coming to visit us. When their feelings are like this, they're not going to.